Greetings from TSE Institute of Technology and Applied Research, Department of Computer Science and Engineering. Department of Computer Science and Engineering is organizing bits, bytes, and packets series of online talks on computer science topics and alternate career options. We cordially invite you all for the international webinar on autonomous vehicles past and present. Our eminent personality amongst us, speaker, um, Mr. Shyam Sundar, Head Product Management, Faraday Futures, San Diego, United States of America. So now I request Dr. R. Mani Meghlai, Professor and uh, Head, Department of Computer Science and Engineering, PSG Institute of Technology and Applied Research to unveil the profile of our guest. Madam, over to you. Very good morning and good evening as well to all who have joined for this webinar on autonomous vehicles, past and present. I sincerely thank everyone for joining this talk and wish everyone to stay safe and stay strong. I am sure the word car itself is fascinating for many of us, at least for those who were born before 1980s, if not uh, the Gen Zs and the Gen Alphas. Even for Gen Zs and the Gen Alphas, uh, like most of you, I am talking about, I am sure when you people are going for a job and start earning, your first and immediate purchase will be to buy a super duper car. I am sure about it. If the word car itself is fascinating, what about connected cars? What about autonomous and driverless cars? With the industry 4.0 gaining prom prominence, along with more and more automation of industry manufacturing operations, IoT and edge computing, in my opinion, the days to witness the driverless, self-driving connected cars on the streets are not very far off. With these minimal words about the topic of today, on behalf of the management, faculty members, and students of PhD Institute of Technology and Applied Research, Koyamathur, I take immense pleasure in welcoming the guest speaker of today, Shyam Sundar, Head Technology Product Management at the Faraday Future, and all participants for this webinar. We are really overwhelmed about the number of registrations we received, which is around 800 plus. This talk is also live streamed in YouTube. If you are dropped out and are not able to join the Zoom session, you can join the YouTube live stream session. At the outset, I appreciate the efforts made by the coordinator of this webinar, Dr. Kala, and the support rendered by Vilasini Madam and Navin, Prak uh, Navin Ganesh for uh, streamlining in YouTube. And to move ahead with introducing the speaker of the day. Our speaker, Shyam Sundar, heads the IAE product management at the Faraday Future which is an electrical vehicle startup company based in California, USA. In his role, he defines the technology roadmap, hardware and software strategies for infotainment, autonomous driving, and connectivity for the vehicles of our day future. Sham has been leading in defining the strategy for multiple generations of our day futures, connected infotainment, and autonomous driving products and features. He also takes care of, uh, care of uh, Faraday's future uh, pa partnerships with the global technology companies such as Google, Amazon, Qualcomm, Nvidia, Philips, and uh, several other companies. Prior to joining Faraday Future, Shyam has worked with uh, several smart device projects at Qualcomm. He played instrumental leadership roles in the launch of the world's first Android smartphone, the HTC G1, as well as the very first Android smartphones for Samsung, LGE, Motorola, and Sony. When he was with Qualcomm, he was in the in charge. He was the in charge of bringing Snapdragon processes into the automotive infotainment space, and led the partnership with Google to create Android Automotive. Shyam has led early stage autonomous driving projects for multiple global companies at Nvidia. He serves on the board of advisors of Merlin Mobility, which is based in Colorado. Shyam is a frequent speaker and a panelist at the Connected and Autonomous Vehicle Technology Conferences across the globe. In addition to his BE Computer Science and Engineering from PhD Tech, he has an MS in Computer Science in Wayne State University, Detroit, and an a MBA from the University of California, Los Angeles. He enjoys solving problems. He enjoys solving problems at the intersection of technology and the business strategy. When he is not working on technology, he enjoys travel and photography. He was involved in dramatics club during his college days at PhD Tech and was the president of Tamil Sangam, San Diego, 
he has been actively involved in lot of social activities and also acts as the startup advisor i am sure the act of merely reading his bio data itself gives enough and sufficient motivation to achieve more in our lives shyam the audience is yours please go ahead thank you dr mani meghalai uh any one thing uh, dr mani meghalai uh, kind of did not mention is that uh, i was one of our classmates at in, at psg tech um, we went to we we were the 90 bzs or bzs and um, uh, i should tell one story it's it's really allow me to say a very long story uh, but first of all thank you very much for spending uh, your saturday mornings with me i know it's not easy uh, it's not very easy for me to spend my saturday um, mornings on uh, something that's not family or anything that's uh, you know that's leisure but really appreciate it thanks for all the coordinators uh, for being here and uh, making this event possible for two reasons that i would not have been here today uh, or except for two reasons um one is your hod invited me and i really appreciate the invitation uh, the second one is i would have not been an automotive at all had it not been for your hod um many many years ago and that's a long story it's worth saying it because uh, I, it's not easy for me to praise someone uh, and everybody knows that every one of my friends knows that but this person has to be this incident has to be mentioned it's very very important for all of us so you know after b i went to i mean i was i was working in bangalore for a year went to detroit finished my masters uh, my first job was qualcom in san diego san diego is a beautiful city uh settled down here and just pretty much said okay i have a i have a nice job comfortable you know good pay i've got you know i i i live in the most beautiful city in the world there's nothing more we need to do and then a few years later i mean after one kid later um i come to india and um, i get some messages from my classmates saying let's just meet and i meet um me i meet about four or five of my classmates one of them totally surprises me many years after all of us left college one of them is still in college iit madras and we were like totally surprised and i just said like you know what kept you going uh, she just said okay you know what i just wanted to continue uh, continue my education so i felt so bad about it uh, as in like you know it was so inspiring but i had stopped learning uh, my many many years uh, of like just basically i settled down on a job didn't continue to learn and i came back to the us after that vacation and i told my friend uh, who was also my boss uh, i need to just go you know i always wanted to do an mba so here i met my classmate from be um and she's been just continuing on with her education so i just feel so bad that i didn't continue my education and the next thing i did was he connected me to ucla and i i, was, I wrote my gmat and within a year or two i was in uh, at the right age of 37 after one kid almost the second on the way I, I started as a student in UCLA, and two years later, I had my MBA in UCLA, and that is what brought me into automotive. Qualcomm looked at me and said, "Okay, you're no longer just an engineer. We need you in automotive." So that was a very pleasant accident, but the person who caused it is right in front of you. So really appreciate your help and your guidance to get me there. The lesson I learned from you is never stop learning, and I never never stopped learning since then. So with with that long story, hopefully you know. Uh, that's my message to all of you as well never stop learning never get too comfortable in in your life never get into your comfort zone if you feel very comfortable in your job or your life then you're doing something wrong always feel uncomfortable take risks push yourself harder with that uh, unsolicited piece of piece of advice i'm going to jump into what inspires me a lot these days um it's as i mentioned getting into automotive was quite uh, i mean no pun intended an accident for me but it was uh, something that i absolutely am happy about um i lead technology product management at faraday future um you, some of you might have heard the company um we are based in los angeles we are about 3 400 people in size right now uh, we were founded in 2014 with the intention of creating a smart device on wheels so the goal was not to create an electric vehicle it was to create a smart device on wheels it needs to be electric it needs to be autom uh, autonomous and it needs to be heavily connected and highly intelligent and intelligence means you no know, the vehicle really knows about you learns about you and continues to give you better user experience than your typical car so with that was the founding vision for faraday so aside from uh, i mean i think uh, you already had a pretty good introduction uh, for me uh, and many of my 
uh, roles at Qualcomm and NVIDIA and Faraday have been at the leading edge of technology, not because I wanted that, it was because I never said no when an opportunity was presented to me. Uh, so I'm so happy about that. So Faraday Future, just to talk a little bit about FF, uh, we call that FF. We're, uh, we're based in Los Angeles, as I mentioned, this is our very first car, the FF91. It's an ultra premium luxury vehicle. Basically, it's a, it's, a, it's a very expensive vehicle. I kind of joke that it's a CEO's car. Um, it has a 1050 horsepower motor or three motors um, that gives you a pretty high performance, zero to 60 miles per hour, which is approximately zero to 100 kilometers per hour in less than 2.4 seconds. Um, we've climbed the Pikes Peak in Colorado uh, at a record time. I, I believe it's still, FF91 is still the car that holds that record. Um, we have, it gives you a range of about 378 miles um, at, uh, with a 130 kilowatt hour battery. It's a fairly heavy car. We can definitely improve a lot more than that. I think we can easily go beyond that, but that's the beginning uh, target range. But what's really important about this car is all the connectivity, all the technology that we're putting into it. This is not just a car. Um, and if you look at the Faraday website, you will realize that uh, we're, we're not exactly calling ourselves an EV startup. We're not calling ourselves a car company. Uh, we've got a lot of uh, displays, 11 displays over 100 inches of screens. Um, there's a natural language, language voice first UI, and it's gonna be capable of level three autonomous um, and high performance in vehicle computing. Uh, right now it's 4G LTE connectivity. We're working on 5G and CV2X as well. Adaptive learning through UI, AI, lots of, uh, lots of focus on AI and continuous learning as a vehicle and it'll be connected to the cloud and it'll be able to update all the software over the air. So it's gonna continuously evolve. Um, so we're gonna to talk today about autonomous vehicles. So let's talk about everything that we do shouldn't really be about technology. It needs to be about solving a problem for the world. Um, and that's generally been, you know, Steve Jobs is, uh, uh, what do you call it, his motto. And he always doesn't want to really think about technology. He doesn't talk about technology. Um, what are What is the problem we're really trying to solve when it comes to moving people? There are so many cars around the world, so many people driving around. 1.35 million people die every year due to car crashes, due to vehicle crashes. That's a very, very significant number. We don't even, we don't even think about it uh, as much. And uh, in the US, about 36,000 road deaths happened in 2019 just from car accidents alone. It doesn't count any of the injuries and things like that. Um, and there's over $1 trillion in cost because of these road accidents. I mean, it's total economic cost, not just the cost of the human life. And also in addition to just all this loss, we're talking about congestion and traffic everywhere. Uh, again, looking at just the US, an average American spends about 99 hours in traffic just due to road congestion. In, I mean, they spent about that much in 2019 and over $88 billion is the economic cost. That's about $1,400 per American uh, spent just waiting in traffic. It's a huge, huge loss. So how do you deal with this? How do you, can you reduce the loss both in terms of lives, in terms of time lost, money lost, and in terms of the overall economic loss? Um, that's what the problem is about moving people autonomously. Uh, the first company that kind of attempted this was the Google X project, which is their self-driving car project, which spun off into a company called Waymo. Uh, Waymo recently launched the very first autonomous ride hailing service uh, in Phoenix, Arizona. They've been testing in the Silicon Valley, uh, San Francisco Bay Area, but Phoenix is a city that's easier to deploy an autonomous vehicle service in. So they, they deployed their first. It's called Waymo One. They've been using some vans and as well as Jaguar uh, vehicles. Um, so the, oh, they have tested their vehicles um, well over 6.1 million, if I, uh, if I, no, sorry, 6.1 billion miles um, in, uh, in, in, in simulation as well as in real life. And uh, this autonomous ride hailing service has been running for about 65,000 miles so far in the Phoenix area. Um, in the Phoenix area, they, are, they cover about 100 uh, square kilometers. Many of their cars, and they don't disclose the specific number, many of their cars are actually fully autonomous, as in they don't, 
um, they do not have uh, drivers at all. Um, and many of the, the rest of their cars do have a safety driver at this time. So they're fairly confident about their system. You can book uh, the car using an app and the car comes and picks you up and drops you off in one of those coverage areas. Uh, a minute. Um, Ma'am, yes. someone, uh, Abhinaya, I... please participants, uh, please allow others to listen to the talk. If they are not interested, you can log out. Talana, please uh, remove them from the session. Go ahead, Shyam. Okay, sorry. Um, give me a moment. Uh, the next one is a company called Cruise. They're based in San Francisco. Uh, they're owned by GM and uh, partly invested by Honda. They introduced a vehicle called Origin just a moment, uh, just a few months ago during the COVID uh, lockdown. So Origin again is a robo taxi. Effectively, it's made for moving people. It doesn't have a steering wheel. It just pretty much is a vehicle made to move people autonomously. Uh, and you could see that uh, you know the, I, uh, some of the interior uh, pictures that you might see. There's like four to six people that can be moved in this vehicle. And uh, there's this is still not deployed yet. They're testing many of their vehicles in uh, San Francisco. San Francisco is a very complex city to drive in. So for an autonomous vehicle, it's an, it's an extremely difficult city. And they've done a lot of good work there, um, uh, cruise automation. And they are going to have origin also in Japan, I believe for the, if not for the Olympics shortly thereafter because of their Honda partnership. And the last one, this is an interesting vehicle. It's a company called Zooks. They were recently acquired by Amazon. Uh, this again is a people mover. Four people can sit inside it, no steering wheel. There's no safety driver. It just pretty much can go over a short distance. It's not clear where they're gonna deploy this vehicle. They've been testing this and they recently unveiled the vehicle. An interesting thing about this vehicle is if you don't have a steering wheel, if you don't, don't have a driver, does this vehicle always have to move to the, I mean, it should always, should, should it always drive to the front? No, not really. It can drive in any direction at once. So it can go, I mean, there's no front or back in this vehicle. It can go in either direction and the wheels are pretty much, it can propel itself in either direction and the sensors are covering it in both directions as well. So very interesting set of products coming up, many companies introducing them. These are basically what you call robo taxis, no driver. Um, they move people in short distances under certain conditions, possibly good weather conditions and so on. Uh, but this solves a major problem of, you know, people can use ride hailing, uh, particularly if you look at US, Europe and any of these markets, uh, drivers are very, very expensive. So if you're gonna pay a bill for your Uber, uh, about two thirds of that really goes to the driver. So the driver wages are pretty high. So if you eliminate drivers, you can really make give the price of ride hailing, ride sharing to, I mean, you can bring it down pretty significantly lower. So right now you're paying a little bit over a dollar per mile for much of the uh, trips that you take. Um, it is likely that some of these robo taxis can bring that cost to about 10 cents per mile. So that's a significant reduction in cost. Uh, which will enter, which will make people not buy cars and they would be able to use these ride hailing services. So that's the first major accomplishment of robo taxis, get more people off the road, off driving, particularly you know older people and younger people who cannot easily drive, who need to be, uh, who, who are more likely to get into an accident and keep us all safe and reduce, uh, reduce the loss to the country and families as well. So that's the first application that we're really marching towards. I want to take a pause here and let you guys ask a question. So this is not really a lecture. I want to really share about what inspires me, but it's not very helpful if, you, if it's not interactive. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer uh, as we go. And I'll have these question slides come up every uh, often. So feel free to ask questions at this point and I'm happy to answer them. Okay, no questions yet. All right, so the next time onwards, if no one asks a question, I'm going to ask a question, a pop quiz. Yeah, please go ahead, Shyam. I think participants, uh, please be interactive. Uh, he's very knowledgeable and uh, rich in experience in this domain. Please go ahead and uh, ask your um, any even smallest um, doubts or clarification or how to go about the general questions. Shubham? So there is a question in chat window, sir. Okay. Okay. Shubham, please keep quiet. Uh, actually, I, we are seeing you doing some painting. 
Mam Shubham, you can remove him. Um, Tamil children, when they will we expect autonomous vehicles in India? This is the question, sir. Okay, that's an interesting question, and that question comes up very often. Um, there's two answers to that, right? Uh, we we were talking about the cost of lives. That is a very real problem in India as well. Um, and the other part of it was the cost of uh, ride sharing. That's not as much of a big problem in India, even though some of us might feel that it's expensive. Um, the labor cost in countries like India, not just India, but uh, you know, cool. outside of US and Europe, the labor cost is fairly lower. So uh, if you could bring down the cost even further, that's great, but it's probably not gonna make as much of an impact in a country where the labor costs are much lower already. But going back to that, is autonomous possible in India? Very much possible. It does take, I mean, drivers are much smarter in India than uh, what we can do with AI because an autonomous vehicle at the end of the day needs very, very uh, defined infrastructure. It needs lanes on the road and it needs a very clear boundary between itself and the people. So compared to that, I think there's definitely a lot of infrastructure upgrades needed in India as well. But um, I, I know that there are definitely startups and companies in India working on autonomous and autonomous driving is not all about robo taxis. There's a lot of other applications. Uh, we'll talk about more, uh, more of that as well. Uh, you know, autonomous vehicles can be useful in dangerous conditions as well, like mines um, and uh, and many of their uh, industrial environments. So definitely, there's a lot of uh, good companies and there's a good ecosystem coming up in India. It's more focused on autonomous vehicles, not on the road, but outside of the road. Uh, but th that's still that's still good technology. It's still very useful. It'll have a major impact on the economy as well. So that is another question. Is there any requirement specific? to use the autonomous vehicles? Autonomous vehicles, as I mentioned, they need to, they need a couple of things. One is they need to be able to see the lanes on the road so that they can really stick to the lanes. Um, so clear markers, it basically uses a camera and it says, okay, here's the lanes. I need to stick within these lanes and I need to change, change lanes. So it needs predictability. It needs a very clear um, uh, boundary and it needs very clear rules as to when to stop, when not to stop. And more often than not, you see that autonomous vehicles find it easier to drive in an expressway. Expressway as in literally no cross traffic, no pedestrians uh, and very high speeds and all vehicles follow a certain pattern. Versus urban driving environments are much more difficult for autonomous vehicles. So that's one of the reasons I, I kind of called out both uh, Cruise and uh, Waymo. Waymo chose to deploy in Phoenix. Phoenix is an easier city to drive in. And you know there's not many people on the road and the roads are wider, things like that. Versus San Francisco is a very, very complex city. It's actually, you can think of, uh, you know, it's it's very hilly up and down and very narrow streets and there's double parked cars and lots of, you know, uh, lots of chaos, lots of people on the street and so on. Uh, it's a very difficult city for even a human driver to drive in. So some companies chose to test their vehicles in San Francisco because of the difficulty. Compared to San Francisco, I do think India, and I'm, I'm saying that uh, not in a bad sense, but also in a good sense as well, it is a much more complex driving environment. So that is something for us to be very, uh, to watch out for. There is scope for autonomous driving in India, but it's probably more in some countries and some cities, what might be better is you kind of set aside a part of the city and say, nobody else can drive there. And uh, pedestrians have a separate path. So the roads are for autonomous vehicles only. And many cities are doing that, are planning that in the world. Um, there's scope for that in India. And uh, you, you could really say, okay, you no, know, Think about some parts of Bangalore, for example, or even some parts of Chennai. Just really say this area is only for autonomous vehicles. Nobody drives inside these areas. So many cities in the world are considering that. So there's definitely scope, but it takes a lot more requirements uh, in terms of infrastructure and a very clear set of rules and clear set of markings for the vehicle to follow. So that is another question. How is your production got affected during COVID? Uh, that is a good question. Actually, uh, we, um, I mean, many of the startups, uh, including Faraday, we had to shut down for a few weeks uh, and we had to, uh, we had to work remotely and we are still working remotely. So work continued, all the technology work did continue. But in terms of, if you're specifically asking about vehicle production, 
um, yes, there was an impact for a very, very short time. And then uh, companies came back to manufacture cars. But one thing you might uh, have heard about a lot now is companies are hitting a chipset shortage. So a, a car today is driven by a lot of different microchips. Um, and uh, many of these, uh, there's a silicon shortage and there is a problem with manufacturing silicon. So because of that, many companies are not able to get enough cars uh, through their factory uh, because the chips are coming late. So that is having a major impact and that is impacting the manufacturing of cars, availability of cars in the world. But that's more to do with the silicon shortage than the ability to manufacture cars. So companies are able to come back to you know, full production capacity if it was not for the chipset shortage. Sir, another question is, is autonomous cars suited in India? Will the Indian roads support autonomous vehicles? Well, yes. So there is definitely some really amazing roads in India, right? Uh, not all the roads, um, but there are definitely some really amazing highways in India. So one of the things that's very important about autonomous is, you know, we'll talk about the levels in a little bit, but um, you don't have to have an autonomous vehicle that drives everywhere in every road end to end without any problems. You can clearly define conditions and say an autonomous vehicle will be autonomous only under these conditions. So one such condition could really be on a highway, on, on, a, on a national highway, a very clear defined lanes, I'm gonna drive vehicles. And you're gonna see a lot more of that in the next few slides, even in the US. Um, so if you clearly say this route is good for autonomous vehicles and I'm gonna have autonomous vehicles drive this route, it's still very valuable. So it is very much possible in India. It just takes a bit of preparation. So you can't run trains without laying tracks first. It's just, it's, much, it's a much smaller problem than laying tracks to run trains. Sir, another question. Electrical vehicles versus autonomous vehicles. Which one leads the race right now? What about the speed target? Well, hands down, it's electric, electric vehicles because effectively you're saving on fuel, you're saving the environment, things like that. In COVID, one thing that did happen is uh, we went through these phases. Um, after Tesla's success, 2018 and so on, there was a lot of craze about electric vehicles, uh, actually 2016 and so on. 2018, 19, the demand for electric vehicles and the investment into electric vehicle companies just came down drastically. Many companies uh, either died or came down, came almost to death. Um, and then 2020, because of COVID, I think the interest in electric vehicles, I mean, everybody, everybody came out of their houses and said, okay, because nobody is driving, the sky seems to be so clear. The environment seems to be so fresh. The air seems to be so clean. So there was a there was an interest in electric vehicles and now many companies including my own faraday they we have received good uh, uh funding promises and we're marching towards uh, production because of that so electric vehicles are taking off across the globe there's a lot of interest in that autonomous is a little bit out there i i, I think it's still going to be a long time before autonomous vehicles are going to be seen everywhere uh, they're going to be very very limited for a while uh, and we'll we'll get into the details on that as well Another question, many questions comes in, sir. Which company focuses on launching the autonomous vehicles here in India? If you are using autonomous vehicles, is there any upgrade required on parking? Um, okay, so I don't know the answer to that particular part. If there is a specific company or a specific set of companies working on autonomous in India, um, and I do need to do my research on that as well. Uh, but one thing I can tell you is JLR, which is owned by Tata, has been a very good front runner in autonomous driving, but in the UK. So there's companies that are doing it in that front. I think uh, similar stories with Mahindra as well. There's uh, an Ola Electric is another uh, that's focusing on autonomous de development, probably not in India, uh, but probably in India, but I'm not sure if the R&D happens in India or outside. But there's, so there's a lot of good focus. But with that, I want to kind of, in the interest of time, I want to move. And of course, uh, I'll come back and answer these questions as we have more time, if that's okay. Okay, sir, we'll yes, go, yes, ahead. Ahead. go ahead. Go ahead, ma'am. We can reserve the questions for later part. No, no, no worries. I do want to make sure people are active. They, I don't want to put them to sleep. So I'll, I'll, I'll pause occasionally for questions, but I'll catch up on time as well. Okay, sir. Okay. Okay, so the next part is, okay, you're now successful. Let's say you're gonna be successful at moving people. There's some companies that are doing amazingly well. 
Uh, what about mowing products, mowing, uh, mowing freight? So this is an interesting space. And I believe this is what's gonna be the bigger driver than you know, saving people from accidents. The bigger driver is economy, right? People are always focused on the money part. Uh, 304.9 billion miles were driven by trucks in the USA alone. Those are the big trucks that you see on, the, on, on, on freeways, uh, class eight trucks. So that's a lot of miles driven by these trucks. Most of the economy really runs because of these trucks. Uh, and the freeway system in the US, you might, have heard, you, you might have heard about it. It's pretty elaborate. $762 billion worth of freight was moved in 2019 alone in the USA. Um, so what happens is when there is an accident with a truck, uh, there's a huge loss, $70,000 average loss per truck crash. Truck drivers are extremely careful. They, they, they don't easily get into accidents. Uh, their accident statistics are extremely low, but when it gets into an accident, it's $70,000, which is a huge amount of money uh, on, 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 uh, on what they might be carrying. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's a big impact in terms of the insurance to trucks as well. A typical person in the US would pay about $8,000 for their insurance for a whole year. Um, but a truck uh, play, pays about $14,000, $12 to $14,000. So it's, uh, the insurance costs are pretty high as well. So it's a very, very significant economic impact. So if you were able to make an impact on the trucking business, that's a huge economic impact positively. So one important thing is truck drivers today drive about 2,000 to 3,000 miles a week, which is a lot of miles. Um, and the interesting thing is they spend about 200 days of the year completely outside their home, practically all by themselves, just driving their trucks. And even the 2,000, 3,000 miles is because the government limits them to a certain number of hours a week. So this is a huge amount of miles. And think about a driver just a bored person spending all their time outside home and they're just focusing on the job of driving. I mean, human error, the potential for that is pretty high. And uh, because of this as well, there is a shortage of truck drivers in the USA. So there were 60,000 fewer truck drivers in 2018 and that number is increasing. So if, you, if your economy is going up, you need more trucks on the road and you don't have enough drivers. So your shortage is gonna keep going worse. So that's another problem. That's more of an economic problem to solve. And in, in some ways, saving lives is a part of it, but the impact of lives, I mean, truck, trucking on lives is pretty low. So this company, Too Simple, it's based in San Diego. They were publicly, they were in the news recently. They did their IPO uh, on the NASDAQ, I believe. So they their idea is very simple. They buy, I mean, uh, no pun intended. They call themselves Too Simple. Um, they buy some trucks and they run a trucking service and they chose the busiest route, uh, trucking route in the US, in the US Southwest, which is from California to Texas. I believe it's from, uh, uh, it's from, I mean, basically they, they do run from California, but uh, Phoenix to Houston is one of the busiest trucking routes in the US. And so they have trucks that will run that route autonomously. So this is more of a level two, level three truck. So you, you will have a driver in there and the driver doesn't really need to focus on the road as much and the vehicle pretty much drives on a freeway. So in, when, when it gets to an urban setting, the truck has to be driven by the driver. But that's given that you're spending most of your time on a freeway, that's a huge impact. So that's a, that's a very interesting company that's uh, been making some good impact. They are going to be a trucking services company. So you can book freight with that company. So they're not just giving you, the, they're not gonna give the technology to other companies, at least at this point. Waymo, again, Waymo Via is, a, is another offshoot of the Waymo, the Google X project. Um, they are a different kind of company. They are going to partner with many trucking companies in the US. The technology that runs the Google self-driving car and the Waymo taxi is going to be adopted for trucks. And they're going to work with trucking truck manufacturers in the US and deliver the technology to these truck manufacturers. And they're gonna work with the fleet operators to enable the fleet operators to run their own fleets autonomously. So that will be a pretty interesting business model. It's just getting started. Um, and again, the test route they use is the usual, the Phoenix to Houston route, which is again, the busiest and um, economically most significant trucking route. So the economic impact of just trucking going more autonomous is, it, it's definitely enormous. So and you can see some of this, Mercedes demonstrated their own autonomous trucking uh, 
uh, uh, demonstration as well. And there's a company in Germany called Einride, I believe Germany or Netherlands called Einride. Uh, those are just really pods. There's not even a space for a driver to sit in. This is an interesting use case. Um, it's called truck platooning and it's been demonstrated by multiple companies. It's not that the trucks are autonomous. The, the truck in front is driven by a human driver, just a normal truck driven by a human driver, but there's a radio connection between the trucks and the trucks that are behind it are all following. So whatever the first truck does, the trucks that follow are gonna do it. And those other trucks do not have a driver in them. So basically, you know, you can run a train of trucks only one human driver. So that's gonna be huge from a, I mean, in a, in a freeway, if you're driving from, let's say San Francisco to New York, that's thousands of miles. You don't need 10 drivers for 10 trucks. You just need one driver for 10 trucks. That's, and that, that's, that's enormous. So that's a very interesting use case. It's purely just trucks following one another. So this I get from a friend who is the CEO of a trucking uh, a truck autonomy company. He, he said like, you know, with platooning, with just, a, I mean, like one driver with four trucks following, it's about 30% 30, 30 in freighting, freight trucking costs. And if you go full autonomy on trucking, it's about 45%. And this is an industry where, you know, one or 2% profit is huge. So if you're able to reduce costs by that much, that's, a, that's the impact of that is really big. So now, now's the time for questions. So we let's dump, jump into a few questions, maybe three or four questions, and then we can move forward. So there is a question. Will this self-driving car really safer to ride to reach their destination? Yes, it, it, it is. It depends, of course. Uh, I'm gonna hedge my answer. Um, some companies have made some mistakes with respect to designing their algorithms. Uh, we know some very high profile cases. Um, but if you think about how many real crazy fatal accidents autonomous vehicles have gotten into, it's much, much lower than uh, human accidents. So humans are much more accident prone. And uh, here's the, mo the more important part. An autonomous car makes a mistake and it gets into an accident the engineers can fix it and that autonomous car will never make the same mistake again. That's not true of human beings. So as, as popular as this is in news, when a Tesla gets into an accident and one person gets killed, uh, there's so many other Teslas driving without any accidents. Uh, similar with the Waymo incidents, every incident is publicized. Even if a Waymo just hits a curb or a, or a school bus or a fire truck just at uh, you know, 10 miles per hour, it still makes the news but there have been very few accidents there. Um, there's a metric that basically says a human driver makes an accident every, I mean, on average, given all the human miles driven, human drivers make accidents this number of times uh, in, over this many miles, but that's not necessarily a good metric because one human driver can make, can have create a lot of accidents uh, during their lifetime. So the good drivers and the bad drivers. So if you are able to make all autonomous vehicles as at least as good as the, reasonably good drivers, the average driver, you'll still be able to make them much safer than human drivers. So long answer, but it is very, very, very much possible to make them safer and they are already reasonably safe. Another question, sir, uh, from Hain Sagar. Recently, I have seen that to skip traffic in major cities, some of the companies are planning to use underground traveling tracks are made to travel from one place to another to reach quickly with autopilot technology. Can you tell about this? Yes, it's one of uh, Mr. Elon Musk's projects, right? The Boring Company. Um, it's to get over a lot of the, I mean, again, congestion. Um, if, uh, if some of you have been to Los Angeles, it's one of the craziest uh, cities to drive in. It was the craziest city to drive in until uh, uh, Moscow kind of beat it. Uh, and now Moscow is the most congested city and most uh, difficult city to drive in. Uh, from, from the perspective of traffic. So Los Angeles to, let's say, just getting out of Los Angeles. Uh, let me give you a story. If you drive from San Francisco or San Jose, which is, where, which is the heart of Silicon Valley, down to San Diego, where I live, that trip can take about uh, maybe about eight hours. But you can actually go from San Jose to the out, outskirts of LA in about three hours, three and a half, maybe four maximum. And then the rest of the trip, the remaining four hours is for the about, about 120 miles from the north of Los Angeles 
to the south of Los Angeles and then down to San Diego, which is another 50 miles. So it's a very, very congested area. So the boring company's idea is in cities like that, for people who just want to, it's it's like sort of the bypass road concept uh, in India, but it's uh, it's a little bit more, uh, um, you, you, you basically make people pay a toll and just skip the traffic altogether underground. So another question, is there any rule that one has to travel in the autonomous vehicle without anyone? US government is allowing to drive on road. Who's responsible for any issues caused by the auto vehicle? That's a very good question. We don't know the answer to that one yet. Um, in the sense that there's got to be a policy as to who is liable. So because if if I mean, in the US, liability is a big thing. Uh, if someone causes an accident, the driver at fault pays for the loss of the driver who's not at fault and any losses that it causes. So if there's no driver, then who's responsible? The responsibility can go either to the company or the person who owns the autonomous vehicle, or it can go to the company that made the autonomous algorithm. Uh, so that, that's still being debated. Right now, the liability goes to the owner of the vehicle and the owner of the vehicle today is the same company that makes the algorithm. So it's if, if it's Waymo, it's Waymo. Uh, so, it, but there needs to be a, um, a regulation that says who's responsible if these are two different companies. If GM makes an autonomous vehicle, sells it to me and I run it as a taxi service. So if this car gets into an accident, am I responsible or is GM responsible? There's That hasn't been figured out by the government yet. Right now, GM makes an autonomous vehicle, they run the taxi service. So it, it's, it's still kind of, it's the same company. So another one more question. In autonomous vehicle, heavy rain interferes the roof mounted laser sensors. In its turn, snow can interfere with its cameras. Will it be really challenging for a robot to read human road signs? That's a very, very good question. So that's where the levels of autonomy comes in. We're gonna talk about it in a little bit. Um, Level four autonomy, or everything up to level four autonomy, is you can say when that autonomous, that when that vehicle will not be operating autonomously. As in, if it's very clear, sunny, and it, there's no haze, there's no rain, uh, there's no snow, um, then this vehicle is uh, is going to be autonomous. If it rains, no, we're not going to operate the service. It's a very perfectly good. Uh, definition of level four. And that's one of the reasons companies choose Phoenix. Phoenix, it hardly ever rains. Uh, it's a desert. It, it, it practically never rains. So uh, the up time for these autonomous vehicles is pretty high. And you can clearly also say, I will only operate within this geographical area. Outside of the geographical area, this vehicle will not operate. So geofencing and saying which conditions under which the vehicle will operate, which is basically the operational design domain, ODD, uh, you have to define that and it's perfectly all right to define any ODD and you are still autonomous within that ODD. So one more, one, more, yeah, one yeah. question, sir. Can autonomous vehicle be possible heavily traffic cities like Delhi, Mumbai? Why not concentrate more on driver assist technologies rather than fully autonomous vehicles? Uh, that's a good question. Um, well, uh, I mean, there's, there's people who can argue both ways. Uh, it is probably the heavily, uh, heavily congested, heavily trafficked cities that need autonomous vehicles first so that individuals are not driving their own vehicles, usually one person in the car driving like, you know, miles. Uh, so you should probably just say, you know, there's a zone in Bangalore that no vehicle can drive in except the autonomous vehicles. And there's an operator or there's one or more operators and only autonomous vehicles will operate. So you park your car, get into this autonomous vehicle and you go to your office in that zone in Bangalore. So the most congested cities are the ones that are most hungry for robo taxis at this point. So it depends. Uh, yes, I, it is more difficult, but the governments have to take a role there as well and say, let's geofence this area. This area is only for autonomous driving. So even cities like Singapore are considering that. Okay, so I'll jump into the next few slides. We'll come back to the questions the next time we get a, get one of these question slides. So the last one, this is the very interesting area. Um, there's an economic impact to this as well, but you know, if you're running a small business like a pizza shop, for example, um, in the US, it's kind of difficult because sometimes the cost of operating the shop 
a lot of that is transportation cost, being able to deliver the pizza to your customers, things like that. So there's a there's a lost economic opportunity in many of these companies. Um, there are 15.05 billion deliveries uh, that were made worldwide in 2020. Uh, this is companies like Amazon, UPS, et cetera, um, and e-commerce retail sales were like 4.9 trillion, again, worldwide in 2021, uh, I, probably 20, uh, I might have gotten that wrong. Um, so huge, huge, oh no, actually it is projected to be 20, uh, 4.9 trillion in 2021, huge potential. And think about how many vehicles are sent on the road every day and they are gas vehicles today, right? Um, to, to deliver these products to your homes. So 53% of all the transportation costs are spent on the last mile, as in not from warehouse to warehouse, but from the store to your home. Um, and 40% of that could be saved if you were to be able to do this autonom I mean, autonomously. So there's, there's a lot of human labor involved, there's a lot of vehicles involved, and there's definitely a lot of fuel burn involved as well. So that's a, that's a potentially, again, 40% is a huge number in a business where one or 2% can make the difference between winners and losers. So the interesting companies that have solved this problem, uh, this guy is very interesting because it's called Neuro, it's based in San Francisco. This is a very small vehicle. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's about as tall as a human being. It's much narrower than a typical car. Typical car. There's nobody sitting inside. It's just purely a cart that moves and it can move at slower speeds um, on the right lane or, or basically on the slow lane. Um, and it, it's got a storage area and you can put products inside it. And uh, you know the end customer using a phone app can say, yes, I'm the guy who needs to get the pizza and opens this door and he, he or she gets the pizza and, and closes the door back. So it's a very interesting concept. Neuro believes this is this is the first impact of autonomous. This is the company that's going to be most successful in, in autonomy because A, these vehicles can move really slow. When things are getting bad, they can just stop. They don't have to keep going. Uh, there are no humans inside the vehicle, so there's nobody to protect inside the vehicle. You only have to protect the guy outside the vehicle. So half of the problem is solved. The other part is it's a light vehicle, it's very small. So as it goes on the road, even if it hits someone, hits a car or hits up a pedestrian, the damage cost is very, very small compared to you know, running a Waymo a truck or a Waymo van. So these are the interesting concepts and these are the reasons why they said, okay, we are gonna be successful before anyone else. But go back to this question of if I'm running a pizza shop and I have to spend a lot of money on delivering pizzas, and I have to hire a person to do that and they have to have a car and they cost accidents. There's liability there and there's a lot of economic impact there. Um, having these trucks, if I'm a pizza shop, I can just rent this truck, right? Just rent this vehicle and deliver a lot of pizzas. You can see there's so many pizzas stacked inside that. Um, so very, very low cost. So that can make, make the difference between a small pizza shop being a successful business versus closing down. So the again, this is, more for smaller businesses, this could have a very, very, uh, very positive move and very positive impact on these businesses as well, particularly when margins are pretty low because of the low volume business now with COVID. So this is a very interesting company. They solved uh, part of the problem by not even addressing it. There's nobody inside the vehicle, so I don't need to save them. Then this is Amazon as as always. Uh, so you you know how many Amazon uh, you know delivery vehicles make uh, trips every day in every city uh, across the world. In the U.S., it's almost ridiculous. I cannot um, I cannot drive a mile in my neighborhood without seeing three Amazon delivery trucks at any time of the day. So um, this is uh, th what they're basically doing is I don't need to send all these trucks. I'm just going to send robots to your house, uh, and these robots will bring your product. Uh, you open it with your phone and you take your product. So there's no way you can claim that you did not get the product. So they're working on this project as well inside Amazon. So autonomous product deliveries is going to be another interesting space to watch. Very few companies, but very interesting product concepts. Um, so again, compared to robot taxis, I think this is an easier problem to solve and have more of an economic impact. So the bottom line here, transition to autonomous vehicles will have a massive positive impact on both human lives saved, the economy globally, and also climate change. Many of these are battery operated vehicles. They're not gas vehicles. That's a great thing. Over the next 10 plus years, you're gonna see that positivity come up. 
uh, as we get more and more uh, autonomous vehicles on the road and become more successful in automating uh, vehicles. Now we jump into uh, maybe three, four more questions and then I'll, I'll pick up the speed. Do we have any questions? Do you have a system to check fitness of drivers while driving itself? For example, sleepy, health, heart attack. Why is uh, RTK GPS more accurate than DGPS? Which is better, sir? LIDAR or stereo cam setups? Wow, that's a, that's a number of questions in one go. So for human-driven um, vehicles, so there's a lot of cool things that are coming up now. Uh, emotion monitoring is a big thing and the health monitoring is part of that. So we, we started out with this thing called driver monitoring. I mean, is, are you looking straight? Are your eyes closed? Are you droopy? Are you falling asleep? Are you drunk? Uh, those kinds of things, very few things. Deep learning, just saying, okay, you know what? A, a drunk driver looks like this. So if you, you, you basically say, I'm 90% confident this person is drunk. So you, there's, there's a warning. So it started out as driver monitoring. It went to the next level of you know, emotion monitoring of all the people in the vehicle. Are you happy? Are you feeling very hot inside the vehicle? Very cold inside the vehicle? Uh, are you sleepy? Are you bored? So let's say I'm listening to a song and I don't like it. I show it in my face. The car basically says, he doesn't like the song. I'm going to change the song. So there's all these interesting use cases that are being considered because of emotion monitoring. And uh, health monitoring is another part, right? Uh, the driver is feeling like, you know, my BP is really up. Uh, that's very visible to the AI algorithm monitoring me. I should not be driving and I, I'm more likely to cause an accident or I'm really angry at someone. Um, I have road rage. I should not be driving. Things like that. So those kinds of use cases are becoming very popular. They're not deployed in a lot of vehicles, but they're being demonstrated a lot. So there's quite a few things going on in that uh, space. Um, in terms of positioning, I mean, it, what technology is going to be the winner? We don't know yet. I mean, there's definitely competing technologies. Everyone's got their own view of uh, wh what is going to win. Um, ultimately, what is the goal here? You want to be able to locate your vehicle down to a very low level, low metric accuracy. So some people believe for autonomous vehicles, you need to have millimeter level accuracy. So which is probably an overkill, but some companies do believe that very, very specifically saying, I need to know within 10 millimeters as to where my vehicle is on this road. Um, and uh, they use a lot of techniques to do that. GPS is one of them, but it's the most noisy. But the best way to do this is to have multiple sensors having uh, you know, LiDAR point clouds, uh, being able to estimate your location using stereo cameras or even monocular cameras being able to do depth estimation is getting better. It's an algorithm part, but multiple sensors telling you the same thing and you kind of really getting yourself located using a lot of, I mean, amidst all these noisy signals is the better approach. So don't depend on just one technology as generally been the, the approach in autonomous driving. Uh, any other questions? So no more questions? Yes, yeah, right. Shyam, uh, I'm sorry. There are a lot of questions. Um, okay. uh, I'll just read out the last one. Uh, will the autonomous vehicles once after its endurance life can be recycled? <laughs> Someone thought about recycling it, okay. That's, uh, that's actually a good thing. So uh, thanks for thinking about it. And we are all thinking about it as well. One of the, the there's a very interesting question that comes up. Uh, I, it is, okay, today, if I, if I buy a car, I kind of keep it for like 10 years. That's generally in the US. And that car actually lives on for like 20, 25 years. So today we are all talking about technology, right? I'm going to put the latest chipset from Qualcomm into my car and I have a really wonderful uh, infotainment system, but that chip becomes really old in about a year. Um, you can go buy a new phone with a newer chip, but you cannot do that with a car. So what's the lifetime expectation for, uh, for technology in a vehicle? That, that's, in, that's another way to ask this question. What people are coming up with is in the autonomous world, your vehicle is gonna do something like 20, 30,000 miles a month. So that's, that's about the time, amount of miles that I would drive in three years. 
So an autonomous vehicle gets is the impact on the autonomous vehicle. What, you, what you're losing is really probably wear and tear on the tires, on the motor, and maybe the battery uh, just kind of getting exhausted. But the rest of the, there are many parts on the vehicle that are not, that are still good and they could be recycled. And uh, possibly the batteries can have to have a second life as you know power walls and houses. So there's aspects of this that are being looked at. And then what happens is I just take the body and the platform and put new batteries, new motors, um, and uh, the, the latest Qualcomm chip and the latest NVIDIA chip, and just you have a new vehicle. So that is now possible with electric vehicles. And as we see more and more usage of vehicles and in the autonomous space, you can do that. You can reuse vehicles. So there's a lot of research being done in this space as well. So from that perspective as well, not only are you saving on fuel, not uh, em emitting a whole lot of carbon dioxide, you're also uh, you know, actually recycling, uh, recycling metal and various uh, parts of the vehicle. And any other questions? Okay, so I'll, I'll run through this. I don't wanna keep you for too long either, but we'll, we'll jump into this. So this question is a very interesting one. What's ADAS and what's autonomous driving? So what's really, is there a difference or is it the same thing? Um, ADAS is typically what you find in a car that you would buy, all the safety features, right? AEB, automatic emergency braking, adaptive cruise control, uh, lane departure warning, pedestrian warning, all those things that a human driver uses to make themselves safer and makes themselves more comfortable uh, in, in sitting inside the vehicle. Versus autonomous driving is there's no driver. You're eliminating the driver completely. You're taking over the driving functions. That's, that's one of the major differences. Um, some of you are familiar with this. The Society of Automotive Engineers have something called uh, levels of autom uh, uh, automation. Uh, there's level zero, there's no automation whatsoever. Level one is, so there's two functions in a vehicle, right? Longitudinal control, which is going front, going back, applying the brake, and lateral control, which is turning left, turning right. So if you were to do just one of them, uh, so level one is just purely warning. Uh, I'm gonna tell you if you're passing through the lane, if you're seeing a pedestrian, if you're getting too close to the vehicle in front of you, I'm just giving you warnings. I'm not gonna take any, uh, sorry, let me take a step back there. Level zero is that I'm just gonna give you warnings when you're doing something wrong and uh, you, will, uh, you, will, you will correct yourself. So I'm not gonna do anything. Level one is where you either do lateral control or longitudinal control. So adaptive cruise control is a good example of longitudinal control only. So that's a level one feature. AEB, automatic emergency braking, level one. And lane center control, I mean, staying within a lane and the vehicle takes care of steering, um, that's a level one feature. When you do both of them, lateral and longitudinal control, that's called partial automation or level two. So mostly that's what companies call autopilot or super cruise, things like that. Um, it's level two. The driver is still in charge. You are, if, if there's an accident, the driver is responsible. So the car is not completely responsible. Now go into what is conditional automation. You're trying to cross that barrier. It is still kind of level two, but for a brief period, maybe for a few hours in a particular zone, I can afford to not keep my eyes on the road and I can read a book or I can watch a movie and the car will tell me if my attention is needed. So when the car tells me that my attention is needed, I have to step up and I have to take over the wheel. So this is usually used in very crazy traffic jam situations. I don't wanna stay focused on the traffic. I'm just gonna let the car drive itself at a very, very low speed. But when the car needs my attention, I will take over the wheel. So that's a level three. It's very rarely deployed by many companies because it's so complicated. Um, and, the, and the takeover mechanism is extremely complicated. There's a lot of regulation as to what constitutes level three. So most companies just say, my car is level three only in Japan or only in Germany or only in this region in Germany, things like that. So there's a lot of variability in that. So many companies are saying for this reason, I don't want to go to level three at all. Level four is what we spoke about, geofenced under certain conditions, the car is completely autonomous, no need for the driver to take over at all. Worst case scenario, we just try to slowly pull over and safely stop uh, rather than expect a driver to take over. So there is no expectation for a driver. Full automation level five is where 
you know, you're going to be able to drive under most, if not all conditions, going from anywhere to anywhere in the world, you know, from my home to my office and then back to my home. Or if I just want to go somewhere to a restaurant, it should just use the maps, find its direction and go there. So there's no limitation on where this vehicle can go and at what time it can go. So that's level five automation. So we're really far away from getting to level five automation. So most of your questions that came up, okay, can we do this? Uh, is, is the situation better in India for level one, level two? Uh, level one, level two, it's only useful to an extent. It's only useful to in, in a highway or freeway scenario where there are no cross streets and things like that. So that's why it's kind of more difficult in an Indian setting. We might actually be like a more, uh, I mean, more able to do level four uh, geofenced autonomy in certain cities. And that might be more uh, you know, impactful as well. So level one and two features, mostly deployed in personally owned vehicles, Tesla, Tesla autopilot, no matter what they call it, FSD, full self-driving and things like that, it's level one and level two, uh, maybe approaching level 2.5. Audi A8 um, was two years ago launched with a level, the world's first level three, but then it was so complicated getting regulatory approvals in some countries of the world. They said, it's only gonna be level three in Germany. Similarly, Honda, I believe, announced a level three only for Japan. So because of the regulations as to what level three is. Okay, so just I'm going to jump through this as fast as possible so that, uh, you know, this is not this is you can find this on the NHTSA's website, the, the National uh, Highway Transport Safety Administration, uh, Highway Traffic Safety Administration. Uh, they have a website. Uh, this is this is the this is the government body that regulates all Trap transport in the US and they set a lot of rules. So this is just a table that they put together to say how safety has been enhanced decade over decade or uh, you know five years, six years. Um, right now we're pretty much, you can see that the first safety features were really more like seat belts, very mechanical. The second set of safety features were lights and uh, maybe radars. Um, and then the third set of safety features is where cameras start coming in, rear view video systems and so on. The fourth set partially automated, cameras, radars, lidars, you name it, they, they start getting into a lot more autonomous. Um, and 2025 plus is where full automated safety, basically highway autopilot. I get on the highway, I can read a book, the car goes from San Diego to Los Angeles, which is like 120 miles. That level of uh, autonomy is what's expected in 2025 plus. Now we can jump into a few questions, maybe three, four questions and, and resume from there. Uh, Dr. N. Muthusami has asked, due to road congestion, can drone will be better for small deliveries? Yes, it could be. It depends on certain markets. Um, in some countries, drone is probably the only way to do this. Uh, drones obviously have one problem, right? If a, if a robot on the road has a problem, it can stop and, uh, and pretty much send a signal to say, come and retrieve me or help me. Um, but drone, it just falls on somebody's head. So that's, uh, that's a little bit more, uh, um, it, there's, a, there's a lot more regulation and there's a lot more safety uh, redundancy that's needed for drones. But yes, in a very congested country, in a very congested area, or in many parts of Africa where the distances are really huge and there are no roads, um, it's, uh, drones have been proven to be very helpful uh, you know, for even emergency medicine deliveries and things like that. And Amazon's been looking at that in the US as well. Um, it's probably you know, the, the FAA regulations are gonna be much more stringent, so they might find it easier to do uh, robot, road deliveries. So any, any more questions? Yeah, participants, um, uh, because I was uh, logged out, I see only one question in the chat window. If you want to go ahead, please unmute and ask questions or you can type in the chat box. There was a question I saw related to security aspect of it. How, um, what about a hacking hack hack and the autonomous vehicles be hacked? What are the facilities provided in the autonomous vehicles to in order to avoid hacking? That was one of the earlier question I saw. Oh, okay, that's a very good question as well. Vehicles are becoming more software uh, driven. Um, there's, there's, a, there's the hardware, the role of hardware in vehicles is getting consolidated. We're doing more and more software. Uh, so that means the vehicles could potentially be more vulnerable. Theoretically, that is entirely true. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's more of a philosophical discussion. 
if you think about it, the same fear was true for phones as well. And now you have literally billions and billions of phones. You don't hear too many security hacking incidents. You hear of phishing incidents where the owner of the phone lets an attacker in, but you don't really see many hacking incidents. And again, going back to if there is a problem, it's easier to fix because software updates, you fix once, you just deploy it to a billion devices. So in that context, the same thing will apply to cars. Yes, initially someone's gonna keep, people are gonna keep trying to hack cars. Cybersecurity is gonna be very, very important um, in software defined vehicles, not only autonomous vehicles, but over a period of time, they will get more secure because you can fix the issues faster, you can deploy them over there through over there updates. So that's, I don't see this, that as a major concern. Okay, the next one is uh, from Muhammad Ashik. It's more of a comment, um, which is the best way to market the electrical vehicles and autonomous vehicles. In my point of view, I believe we need to convert all public transport to electrical vehicles. I hope this will be the best way to reach people. Your comments, please. I would totally agree with that. I, I in fact, uh, I have, uh, I, well, I cannot uh, disclose a lot of details. I've been talking to many companies about potentially doing exactly that, um, using some of uh, some technology that's already available in the market. So this is a very in, important interest area. And um, particularly in countries like India, this is going to be the biggest impact in terms of not only city pollution, uh, but also noise pollution and also you know fuel consumption. Um, I, I do think there's a lot of potential. Some companies working very hard on this. Um, obviously, China has taken the lead in this as well. Uh, there is a there's a company called Arrival in the UK. They are making electric buses. Um, very very admirable company, and I think they are. I, I, last I heard, they had some interest in uh, you know working on some Indian projects as well. And there's I've heard of projects in Australia as well. So I do think that's. That's another area, particularly in countries like India. I've heard this in Brazil, Argentina, um, and even some areas of Los Angeles and San Francisco. Buses going electric is a, is a huge value. Totally agreed. Yeah. Okay. Gayatri is uh, concerned about what about uh, 24 bar 7 helpline or assistance uh, from the manufacturer side to the buyer or owner, even during the driving time. Sorry, could you repeat that question? Yeah, it is uh, the helpline, a 24 bar 7 helpline or assistance available. Uh, okay, to whom, Gayatri? I don't know to whom. Uh, the question is 24 bar 7 helpline or assistance available from manufacturer to the buyer or owner of the car during driving time. Okay, um, that is a, actually, that's a very good question. Um, if you are referring to driven cars, uh, the the cars that are driven by humans, we are seeing a lot more, I mean, this is not directly related to autonomy, but we're seeing a lot more advancement in the voice assistance. So you don't necessarily have a human being helping you, but you, you, many of you have seen that Google video of the Google UI pretending to be a human and really being very intelligent. So we're getting very close to that. So if you need help, uh, voice assistants are now making their way into cars, Alexa, Google Assistant, um, and uh, Microsoft Cortana, et cetera. And many of the car OEMs have their own voice assistant as well. So lots of that coming in, very intelligent features that are driven by the cloud, but that is really voice assistants, human-like, it doesn't necessarily always involve a human. And of course, if you need to talk to a human, some companies uh, do allow that to happen as well. But yeah, th those days are al already here. If not, uh, if not in India, it's it's pretty much making its way to most of the vehicles across the globe. Um, in the autonomous okay. context, yeah, sorry, to, just to yeah, sorry, maybe that question was in the autonomous context. Yes. So one of the scenarios people are really afraid of is, okay, I'm sitting in an, I mean, it's late night. I'm in an autonomous shuttle going from one place to another. Something goes wrong. The vehicle stops. How do I race uh, for help? Um, these vehicles, again, they have assistance, uh, emergency monitoring. You're usually never alone. The vehicle is not, uh, you may think you're alone in the vehicle, but generally these operators, they use, they have monitoring features. Um, they, they are visually monitoring you in the vehicle. And of course, they are always, uh, some of the vehicles, they can be controlled remotely. So if it's, if something wrong, goes wrong with the autonomous, they can be remotely restarted. If the vehicle doesn't respond, they could, I mean, 
there's even the ability to with 5G speeds, you can even drive the vehicle remotely um, to a safe place. So all those features are available in autonomous vehicles. Again, there are a lot of questions uh, for when the autonomous cars will come for uh, come to India and for the okay. Indian road, how it will be. I think these questions are answered at the beginning or in the middle uh, much earlier. We'll move on to other questions like, um, uh, okay, what are the main challenges currently uh, uh, facing the, to design the autonomous vehicle systems? Current main challenges in designing autonomous vehicle systems. Um, allow me to come to the later slides. I'll talk about that. Um, autonomous yeah. vehicle will, I mean, there's, as you might have seen in the first half, right? We, it's not, there's no single class of vehicles called autonomous vehicles. So there's different use cases, different set of features, but the biggest challenge all of them face is the long tail of scenarios to address. So you, you can never be certain that you've addressed every single problem that a vehicle will encounter on the road. Uh, that's where, you know, one of the things we're always saying is you cannot expect the vehicle to be able to drive itself in a San Francisco street as San Francisco is today. But maybe the government has to step in and say, let's change the San Francisco streets to what an autonomous vehicle can drive itself in. So there's, it, there's got to be a little bit of a middle ground there. Uh, but I'll, I'll talk about the problems as we go to the next few slides. Yeah, would there be anarchy or probably she means, uh, Abhinaya means war between driverless cars and human driven cars when both are running together on the road? Um, most of us are praying that they will not be running together on the road uh, for, for, for maybe just, except for maybe a short time, maybe a few years. Uh, they are running today in the Bay Area all the time. Um, you know, there. Uh, I, I always used to say a joke uh, that when I was uh, growing up in in Coimbatore, uh, there was a movie called The Car. Uh, as a, as a kindergarten kid, I went and watched that with my parents. It's a ghost movie. There's a car. You don't see anyone inside that car, but it drives and kills people. Um, in 1982, I think. So, <laughs> interestingly, in San Francisco, you can see a lot of cars like that these days. So it's it's no longer driven by ghosts. So it, it's getting common and these cars are actually, uh, you know, the, the most annoying part about autonomous cars are they're much more careful than human drivers. So they do irritate humans because they're more careful than human drivers, but they do coexist even today. Okay. Saktivel is uh, concerned about what will happen if the AI fails while in use. What are the countermeasures to tackle such scenario? It's the same as what will happen you're on a plane, it has four engines, all four engines fail, or actually maybe two engines fail. The other two engines are powerful enough to, you know, at least get you to a safety airport. Um, the systems are built in such a way that they're redundant. The four engines together will almost never fail unless there's a, there's a really major incident. So similar situations, there's redundancies built everywhere. There's safety watchdogs, there's redundancies built everywhere. If one computer crashes, another one will take over. Uh, there will be lockstep checks in between. There will be a safety watchdog that's watching both computers, things like that. So the idea behind an autonomous vehicle for level four, level five is any problems happen. The vehicle shouldn't just be, you know, it shouldn't go crazy. It should safely, you know, turn on the hazard lights and slow down and go to the right lane or left lane in India's case and park itself. So it needs to have enough power to be able to do that. So there's enough redundancies built into these autonomous vehicles. Okay, before moving to the next question, Roshini, you are painting on the wall. Please, uh, please avoid doing such things. I think the talk is going very interestingly. Please um, uh, reference the talk and the resource person knowledge. Okay, the next question is, how do we import knowledge about the car for rural people of India? Um, knowledge about autonomous vehicles, you mean? Yes, I believe. I think it is a type of car. I think I, it is meant autonomous vehicles. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I, here's a parallel example. I mean, even, even urban people, the first time you get into an autonomous vehicle, it's nerve wracking. It's not easy for you to, uh, to, to, get, to get used to that idea. Uh, the first time I was in one, it was a very, very safe car. It stopped for a school bus. It stopped for a pedestrian who was crossing the road. It did everything right, but I was extremely nervous. 
but you kind of get used to it. You two or three rides, you start expecting, you, you start knowing what to expect. So it's sort of similar to how did we introduce escalators to people in India, right? Uh, it's, it's a very similar example. There are still people who are afraid of escalators. I know that. Um, my, my mother is one of them. But uh, if you think about it, most people got used to the idea. So similar. Uh, I think the fear of autonomous vehicles, everyone has that. And it just grows. You grow away from it over time. Okay. Can you please throw some light on disaster recovery uh, using autonomous vehicles interconnected via SDN, IoT, cloud? Uh, disaster recovery. Um, maybe I need a little bit more detail than that. I mean, are we talking about? Uh, I mean, are we talking about autonomous vehicles operating in a hazardous zone like a mine or? A, a yeah, blast? probably. The question goes like this: What are the most recent research? Which advances in disaster recovery using autonomous vehicles. Okay, so I'll maybe this doesn't directly answer that question. The space, the space where in let's say in uh, harbors, yeah. uh, containers being operated, freight being moved, um, and uh, in mines where you know obviously it's very hazardous for human beings to get into mines. So autonomous vehicles is becoming very very popular in those spaces. So these are vehicles that would need to operate at very, very low speeds. There is no road, there are no lanes, but you would need to go, there's a predefined path. You go in and you operate, you come back out. So there's a lot of research being done in that space as well, both in defense and non-defense in, and industrial use cases. Recently, I started seeing a lot more focus on ships. Uh, it's a, the, same, the, the economics of that is similar to trucks, right? Uh, you're going to be driving miles and miles and miles in, on oceans, and you're doing that at about 30 knots per hour, which is very slow. Um, so instead of having humans do this, why not an autonomous algorithm do it with all the sensors uh, in tow? So different applications are coming up for autonomy, including hazard situations. Okay, the next question is basically... Uh, if uh, some people are planning to do some kind of uh, stealing or controlling the vehicles while traveling purposely or making accidents purposely, how can you avoid or prevent this? Um, well, if you're inside the vehicle, there is no wheel, brake or uh, gas pedal to take over the vehicle. Um, and as I mentioned, hacking the vehicle through your phone or something else, it's going to become more and more difficult. But there is a very... Uh, there is on YouTube, if you might, if you search for um, Cruise uh, Perception Lead, Stanford. So the perception lead for uh, the cruise automation company, he gave a lecture in Stanford. In that video, he puts out scenarios in San Francisco where their, their vehicles run into all these scenarios. Uh, like for example, drunk people in the middle of downtown San, Diego, San Francisco in the night, one of the cruise vehicles goes past them. That guy jumps in front of the vehicle just to confuse the vehicle, things like that. But the vehicle handled it extremely gracefully. What's worse, it records the whole incident and that guy puts it on YouTube. So very interesting things people will try. Uh, of course, uh, you've got to, the vehicles are built to handle scenarios like that. That's where behavior prediction is one of the major areas. And we are going to talk a little bit about that too. Good going, uh, Shyam. I think that's all I have in the chat window. We'll go ahead. I think time is also up. We'll yes. go ahead and uh, probably take a couple of questions later. Sounds good. Okay, we are diving into the technology, just like some of the questions raised. We these These are the major building blocks of an autonomous system. Perception, which is the vehicle seeing and understanding what's around it. So sensors sensor fusion, detecting objects, classifying objects, and figuring out where the road is and where the road is not, uh, using cameras, radars, lidars, and ultrasound, and maybe other sensors as well. There's a lot of new sensors coming in. The techniques used are computer vision, image processing, deep learning, um, lots, of, uh, lots of algorithm work, lots of uh, computing power. Uh, very good progress on this. I think perception is more or less a solved problem. Uh, there are many, many companies, hundreds of companies working on this. So it's a very interesting space as well. Um, I'm pretty sure some of you are working on some sort of perception for robotics or vehicles. Uh, localization is where the vehicle needs to know where it is in the world and also relative to all the surrounding objects. So how far away is it from the nearest obstruction? And how I mean, that is important before it decides where to move and how to move there. 
So vehicle positioning, mapping, uh, uses GNSS, different variants of GNSS, using IMUs, inertial measurement units, basically the, the, the three uh, gyrometer, accelerometer, and compass. Wheel ticks, so turn of the wheel and how, how many inches or how many millimeters per second does the wheel cover. And uh, standard definition, high definition maps, and even down to millimeter level accuracy, visual positioning, which is very interesting using cameras. If I see a building and I can say, okay, based on all the information I'm seeing the, from this perspective, here is how far I think I'm away from that building based on just purely looking at something and saying, I think I'm 10 meters away from the building. LIDARs are very, very good at giving you some distance depth as well. So techniques used, occupancy grids, odometry, Kalman filters, particle filters, simultaneous uh, localization and mapping, which is a very interesting technique in many, many areas. And uh, path planning is where the vehicle now decides, okay, I'm here, I need to go there. That could be, I'm here in uh, San Francisco, I need to go to Los Angeles. It's, it can also be, I need to travel the next two meters. How do I do that? Uh, how many object, objects are there? How many potholes are there? Where are the lines? How do I travel that? So planning your mission, planning your behavior, local path planning and velocity profile. How, how do I speed up? How do I slow down to go stop at that next stop? Um, Again, occupancy grids, finite state machines, road network graphs, path prediction, shortest path searches, time to collision uh, calculations, collision checking, map tracking, and tra trajectory propagation. So some very, very interesting stuff uh, that goes on here. You might see some, uh, some uh, Tesla videos on how they predict curvature. If they're driving through a curved mountain path, they can actually predict how that path curves um, using AI. So that's a very interesting area of uh, study as well. Behavior prediction is where, okay, I'm, I'm driving in the middle of a whole bunch of people. Are they gonna jump in front of the car? Are they walking in a certain direction? Are they gonna turn around? Uh, or is someone gonna come in front of me? Pre trying to predict all the actors around you and what they will do next and uh, kind of reacting to that before they actually do that. Um, object tracking, behavior prediction, motion prediction, trajectory tracking. So many different things that we can do. And the last part is control. This is where purely it's mechanical. Longitudinal control, lateral control to say, okay, you're gonna do this. You're gonna go fast at this speed. You're gonna turn left, things like that. Kinematic modeling, dynamic modeling, uh, vehicle dynamics, PID control, model predictive control, lots of work being done in this space. And in my view, this is just purely my view, this is gonna be very, very important for vehicles. Perception is almost a solved problem, localization more or less. Path planning, behavior prediction, there's a lot of good research being done. But what is unique to your vehicle? It's really control. How does my vehicle accelerate, slow down, stop? Uh, it, does it feel like some mad guy is driving the vehicle or does it feel like a very well-trained driver is driving the vehicle? Things like that. So that's where the user experience comes in. So we will just take a very brief pause for maybe one or two questions and then we can move on. Are there any questions? Okay, so I'll, I'll move yeah, on. Um, Go ahead, please. One sec, only one question. Um, is it, uh, it is only possible, I'm sure. Uh, what do you think about India? It is only possible to implement the electrical vehicle by only standardizing Bharat standard four. I'm not sure, sure whether I understand the question. Or Bharat standard six, which means BS four comma six. I think being a domain expert, you should be knowing the question better. Oh, well, that's not my domain expertise, uh, but um, you know, India, India is actually doing extremely well. I'm not sure if you guys. I mean, I, I, I kind of believe India is going to be much ahead of the U.S. in electrification. Um, in in the U.S. right now, it's like a few car companies. Tesla is pretty much the one. Um, and uh, many people still do not want to use electric vehicles. They're still, we're still very addicted to our gas vehicles. Versus India has been already pioneering in smaller vehicles, right? The auto rickshaws and things like that. But it's also making it into cars. And uh, I mean, well before the US, India mandated that 2030 for transition to electric. So I think that will get accelerated. That will move forward really, really fast. Um, so I think 
I'm, I'm very, very bullish on India becoming, uh, you know, more or less all new vehicles going electric much before the US gets there. Yeah, we uh, can go ahead uh, with the talk. Uh, there are no questions as of now. Okay. Okay, jumping right in. Sensors. Um, a typical vehicle has multiple cameras. So the idea is two, 360 degrees of coverage around the vehicle using cameras. Uh, the popular thing we do now is uh, two megapixel cameras are pretty much standard. Some cameras can be eight megapixel, especially the ones that are in the front because you wanna see further and further more accurately. Um, there can be up to five radars, maybe six even. The, there are four corner radars, one in the front, sometimes one in the back. Um, it doesn't really help a whole lot, but sometimes one in the back. Um, LIDARs are very, very expensive. They can be you know, several thousand dollars. Uh, the cheapest LIDARs are about $1,000. So you, do, you cannot put a whole lot of LIDARs in the vehicle, but they are a very, very good sensor. Uh, so typically autonomous vehicles have about maybe, um, because they, are, they can be very expensive, you're not selling the vehicle to a, an end user. They have at least five LIDARs, if not more than that. So uh, autonomous, the fully autonomous vehicles like level four, level five, robo taxis, so on, they tend to overcompensate on the LIDAR side because they can spend, they can afford to spend the money. Ultrasound is just purely very short range, right? Uh, if you're going to hit the curb, that sort of stuff, its range is three, four meters, or maybe six meters in some cases. So that's a, that's a very, very simple sensor. But LIDAR, radar, and camera is where most of the companies are focused on. There's now cross uh, sensors, combination of camera plus LIDAR, combination of camera plus radar, and a 4D imaging radar, which looks almost like a LIDAR. So things like that. So different variations of these sensors, but this is the primary set of sensors. And the computing, the big king is NVIDIA. Uh, they, they are pretty much in almost every autonomous driving system. The NVIDIA GPU is ubiquitous. For most ADAS systems, Mobileye is extremely popular and Intel computers uh, used to be very popular, but not as much. Many companies tend to pair Intel CPUs with NVIDIA GPUs. So there's very, very complex computers that are built for full autonomous vehicles. And uh, that's that's a that stage that that's kind of in its infancy. But as we move forward, even Qualcomm's getting into that game, and Nvidia is also improving the performance of its computer. So you could potentially have a computer like this, which I believe is a Xavier uh, with two Xaviers and two discrete GPUs. This is a Pegasus design. Um, this can give you about 320 tops. Um, and the next generation with Oren from NVIDIA, it can give you more than a thousand tops. Uh, I think more or less 2000 tops in a, in a Pegasus configuration. So lots of really good high performance computers coming up for, uh, for autonomous. So this is a Waymo Jaguar uh, vehicle. This kind of gives you how much data flows through an autonomous vehicle. This is just raw data uncompressed. Each camera generates about 200 megabytes per second. Um, Radars are pretty small, ultrasounds are pretty small, GPS, IMU data small, is very small. Uh, LIDARs can be pretty heavy as well. But a typical autonomous vehicle can generate about four terabytes of data a day. So that's just a raw data. So you've got the challenge of being able to not only flow all that data inside the vehicle, but also how do I get it outside the vehicle, process it, and learn from that data. So there's a that's a very, very interesting data management challenge. And speaking of what can you do about data? So you've seen this classic data science chart. What it says is, you know, the data science is a combination of machine learning, traditional software and data analysis. A car, a, an autonomous vehicle, not only generates data from its sensors, inside this autonomous vehicle, you're doing a lot of things and you're doing a lot of, you're giving it a lot of input. What do you like to do? What movie you'd like to watch? What, you're speaking, you're, you're, you're accessing a menu, things like that. So there's a lot of data that the occupants of the vehicle are also giving the vehicle. Also the ECUs and the, and the components of the vehicle are giving out lots of diagnostic data. And more importantly, an interesting area that's coming up today is, remember that vehicle sees all the roads using its camera. 
it can actually say, hey, there's a problem in the road here. There's traffic here. There's an accident here. There's a, there's a cop standing there. There's a you know pothole here. There's a lamppost that's broken here. All that information can be captured by the vehicle, processed, and sent to the city saying, hey, you know what? This road is broken here. Go fix it. So normally in the old, not even in the old, even now, uh, even very modern cities, they have to do an inspection of roads to find out where the road is uh, needs maintenance. With autonomous vehicles now, Mobileye has made this a business. I will give you the data. You don't have to do an inspection anymore. My vehicles are all over the place. Millions of vehicles with Mobileye cameras. I am going to mine this data and I'm going to tell you, city of Los Angeles, where problems are there in your road. So the city of Los Angeles doesn't spend any money to go inspect the road. The Mobileye computer, I mean, cloud just basically keeps sending them these notifications saying, here at this intersection, you've got a problem. So that's a huge value for smart cities and autonomous vehicles are gonna make that happen. This is the other part, analytics and big data. So we were talking about delivery vehicles, right? Remember most of the autonomous vehicles, as we said, uh, you know, they have, they have an operating domain, but think about a delivery vehicle, a, a FedEx van or an Amazon delivery van or something like that is going through urban streets. It sees the layout of urban streets. It sees every house in the street, every pedestrian, everything in the street. That's a lot of data it collects. So, you know, there's so much data analytics, big data management that happens in a fleet of uh, delivery vehicles, especially if an Amazon is operating tens of thousands of vehicles. Fleet management, lots of data, cloud connectivity, you know, live operations, live real time data analytics, learning, things like that logistics of okay where how are goods moving through a neighborhood uh, how long does it take for a product to go from one point to another things like that optimizing the logistics predictive maintenance you don't need to wait for a vehicle to break down before you say it it broke down you can get diagnostics and say okay you know what i think the tire is going to go in maybe 10 miles so let's bring the vehicle back fix it before it has any more downtime so things like that being more predictive about maintenance part failures things like that and of course, we spoke about the smart cities uh, uh, impact. With all those sensors, the vehicle can collect information that's very valuable to cities. Using connectivity, uh, you know, this is pretty simple on the left side, right? You, you can dynamically update your maps. You know where the traffic is. You can try to avoid the traffic. You can try to anticipate when the light is gonna turn red and adjust your speed accordingly. You can do a lot more computing on the roadside edge, as they call it. And now they're talking about roadside units. The car communicates with them, sends the data. The roadside unit calculates, does all the um, uh, edge computing and sends it back to the car and to the cloud. And of course, the cloud itself, which is pretty common. Vehicle to everything, V2I, V2, vehicle to infrastructure, vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to pedestrian, that's gonna be huge as well. So if the sensors can see what's around the vehicle, V2X can tell you what's what the vehicle cannot see yet, right? Someone else one mile ahead of me sees that there is an accident. I, my car can be notified immediately saying there is an accident, start slowing down. So that's a huge, huge set of features as well. Uh, V2X is in its infancy at this point. It's not clearly defined as a standard. There's a lot of work being done in China, not so much in the Western world. So that's a very interesting field as well. Bring it all together connected vehicles and iot so your these vehicles this is what a bosch concept of an autonomous vehicle looks like these vehicles are going to be your moving office your moving gym uh, you know your moving i don't know party room whatever you call it um, there is so much you can do you can watch a movie you can do your work you can have a meeting um, and that means you know your vehicle is it's a combination of a living room and office um, you name it, any room that you can think of, it's got to be able to provide all that to you. So that means connectivity. It's got all these devices like Alexa, Google, everything. Uh, it's got all these sensors about how, how does the interior cabin feel and also, you know, gesture based control, things like that. Anything you can think of for an IoT device today is possible as a use case inside an autonomous vehicle because the user is basically free. You monitor them and you can do a lot of things for them. So that's a, that's a huge market as well. It's, it hasn't even started. Like I said, emotion monitoring is the first step to getting there, 
but when the driver the, when there is no driver it's all passengers there's so much more to learn from them and deliver to them using iot uh, related technologies okay i'm coming closer to the end of this so i wanted to close this with a very interesting set of slides um, and maybe have a moral lesson in that as well i did a google search for apple autonomous car and here's four renderings i found the four renderings are not from apple uh, they are from different people who thought this is what an apple car will look like because based on apple's cool designs but none of them are from apple so you know as you know apple keeps all their designs very very secret it doesn't leak till the very end but in reality here is the real apple autonomous vehicle not very pretty it's uh, these are unmarked cars sometimes marked as property of apple that are driving around in the silicon valley area a uh, whole bunch of lidars i see there probably about 12 lidars if not more than that and many cameras and that's just a pure just a lexus suv so this is what you see in silicon valley today if you go to the san francisco bay area you see hundreds of these vehicles uh, usually someone sitting there not holding the wheel and the vehicle driving itself pretty slowly in, in many cases the guy on the right side is just basically looking at their computer uh, looking at all the diagnostic data lots of this happens and of course many vehicles that are driverless as well that are just you know getting getting some practice um th there's a moral here so all this technology that we spoke about so far you know it's all not very pretty. There's a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of safety, security concerns. There's so much to be done in technology. It's all in its infancy. This is how you start working on, it, on an autonomous vehicle project, buy a car, put some sensors, very clunky on top of it. There's so much non-glamorous work. Elon Musk once said he has 300 people in the autonomous driving team. 200 of them are just used to label pictures. Only the other 100 are really engineers. So there's a lot of hard work that goes into making autonomous vehicles possible. So there's so much you could do, but there's also so much hard work to do to be able to accomplish that. So just so you know, it's all not a very pretty and glamorous. It's just, there's, there's so much real hard work that goes in here. With that, I wanna really say, we are at the intersection of many computing and software technologies. So many things that I learned at school and I've learned since then, and so many things you are learning today they are not they, they won't even begin to scratch the surface of what autonomous vehicles can do so very very interesting point in history very very interesting point in evolution of humans um but we are still in its you know very early stages there's a lot more to cover before we say okay you know what we really come up come a long way in autonomous driving so from my view the best is yet to come there's a lot more work and I, I hope some of you guys are able to choose this as your path and this as in there's so many things I pointed out as your potential path. Um, but ultimately, you know, I'm really excited about the future. Not only, I mean, and many of you, I know it's, it's great that you're concerned about India. And I think I'm very positive about this having a major impact on India as well. So let's make an impact together. So we'll, we'll make the great things happen. With that, thank you very much for the opportunity. Sorry, I took a long time, but you know, hopefully it was useful. Yeah, you are on time, Chiam, as usual. Uh, so it was a really wonderful session. I think we have a few more questions coming up. One of the questions goes like this. Uh, there will be no emissions from vehicles, uh, if it is electrical vehicles. And will there be a problem with the battery? How do, address, how do we address battery issues in autonomous vehicles? Yes, uh, if you are a cynic uh, or a pessimist, you might say there is emissions from the vehicles. The vehicles have batteries, they don't have emissions, but the batteries have to be charged at your home. And most of the electricity to your home comes from coal fired plants. So that's a very pessimistic argument we have heard, but uh, you know, uh, it's actually okay because uh, it, it, you, uh, the coal fired plants act, emit a lot less uh, uh, you know, uh, greenhouse gases than every vehicle put together. So uh, if you look at it, it's a lot better to the environment, but yes, the, the ability to recycle battery material, it's not a conquered science yet. Companies are actually working through how do you, I mean, is actually the first question is, can I, do, do we have enough, you know, cadmium and lithium and all these, uh, you know, rare metals enough to make batteries for every single person who's going to buy a vehicle in the world? Not really. So, and that's going to become the new oil as well. And that's going to become the source for many wars as well. So that's a big problem. 
but propulsion technologies and battery technologies will evolve. Hopefully, we'll get over we'll we'll get over this without many wars. Uh, but going back, how do I recycle the batteries once they're done? There are there's a lot of research being done. Uh, one of the best examples that keeps coming up now is power walls for the home. So you have a solar system for your home to generate electricity, and you have a power wall to store that electricity, so you can use that same electricity in the night. So that's a very very good place to recycle car batteries. And not only that, there are many other use cases being considered. So that's a very live science, uh, probably not for the computer science engineers, but more for the chemical engineers and the metallurgical engineers to, to look at. Yeah, participants, uh, do you have any more? No more questions? So thank you very much. Um, I mean, if you still have a question, I'm happy to chat for a few more minutes as well. But you know, thank you very much for being a very patient audience. But right? it's 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 been. Uh, it's been a total pleasure talking to you and thanks for the great questions as well. Yes, yeah, Shyam, uh, I was not audible, I believe. Uh, was I audible? Yes, for okay. a, for a uh, I had a personal it. request. Yes, please. Yeah, I wanted uh, I wanted you to talk about the skill set they need to focus on the various disciplines of students. They have to focus on building their skills skill set if they want to work in this autonomous uh, vehicles domain. Uh, well, as I mentioned, right, there is something in it for everyone. Um, this transportation revolution is going to take every skill set we're going to bring into the into the world, uh, including you know, mechanical, electrical, metallurgy, chemical, everything. But if we want to zoom in on the computer science alone, you know, what I would really say is uh, there is so much to do with respect to data high performance computing, uh, deep learning, um, and, and definitely very, very complex software. There's, there's focus for cybersecurity and also building redundant, safe software systems. So, I mean, I, I can't really say there is something in what you will learn in any branch of BE that is not useful in, uh, in this field of autonomous and connected mobility. So there's, there's lots of opportunities. I mean, I didn't, I didn't answer your question exactly, but I just said everything is needed. <laughs> yeah, good. Uh, so any, any other questions, uh, participants? Okay. I thank our guest speaker, Shyam, for giving such a wonderful talk on autonomous vehicles. Shyam, you gave a lot of insights in pretty much in almost all aspects, design, technology, security, various levels of autonomy, and the need for policy make, making, etc. And uh, thank you, audience, for being the wonderful, active listeners and also for the tons of questions you have posted. Shyam, you were amazing in answering all the questions with your rich experience. Thank you once again for sharing your knowledge and wisdom. I thank everyone involved in organizing this webinar and all HODs and faculty members for forwarding the details of this webinar so that more students can attend the talk. See you all in another talk or FDP. 